True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Bill didn't dislike the Potters. Uh, he felt sympathy for Janelle, and he was calling the Potters to ask them to have her stop it. Yeah. She just downloads music all the time and shares it with her friends. She's acting like this phone call upsets her, that this is a threat against her. Johnson County 911. Honey, I need a name with bad. Please. Okay, what's going on? Um, um, yeah, there's no pulse. There's no pulse. I need one of them. They're white. They're kids. Oh, okay. okay, there's blood all over the first on the floor. Oh, my God. Blood on it. Oh, my hand. God. There's a baby here. Okay, how's the baby? Did... He's, he's not crying. He's, he's awake. Probably cried till we can't cry no more. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. And today we're doing a case that I've wanted to cover for a while. Well, the premise is a fascinating one, I think. Yeah. I, I didn't even know what catfishing was, except in the literal sense. <laughs> um, but, Until I showed you the MTV show. Yeah, this is a real education. Yeah. It's amazing, really. It, and this it is truly a, is. This is a remarkable case of catfishing where someone's doing it to someone in the same house with right. the same computer. With the same computer. So, yeah, I'm glad we're finally doing this case. A young mother is shot to death while she clutches her seven-month-old baby. Her husband lies executed in the next room. This isn't the story of a Hollywood crime drama, but it's the tragic end to an average Tennessee working-class family. Billie Jean Hayworth and her husband Billy Payne were going about their normal weekday morning routine when they were senselessly and violently murdered. The events that led up to that morning are inexplicable fueled by the petty ignorance of a woman who used social media to manipulate and to hurt people around her. So we're taking a look at this catfishing crime in this episode of True Crime Brewery, Unfriended. Now settle in for a twisted tale of senseless murder, jealousy, and selfishness that really goes beyond what most of us could ever imagine. So we're going to need a tall, strong beer for this one, Dick. Don't let me down. What have you got? I have a beer called Homestyle brewed by Bearded Iris Brewing in Nashville, Tennessee. Well, Homestyle is an American IPA, so it's a little different from an English IPA. The American IPAs tend to be hoppier. These beers, American IPAs, tend to be pale gold to reddish amber in color. They have herbal and or citric hop aroma, bitter, as I said, and a little bit of malt in the background. This particular one is a cloudy yellow-orange color. There's about an inch of off-white head and a good amount of sticky lace. So it's a pretty visually appealing beer. Yes, it's pretty. It has a citrus aroma, some sweet malt. The taste really comes through with the citrus, orange, tangerine, and grapefruit. Also a little pineapple. Hmm. Uh, and then there's the, the malt, the caramel malt background. This is a medium-bodied beer with a nice lingering bitterness. So it's a nice IPA. Okay, thanks. Let's open it up. Okay, Dickie, let's head on down to the quiet end. There's quite a few people here tonight. Busy place, isn't it? Now we're going to lug down a couple of pint glasses this time. We're going to leave the snifters behind. Okay. So, and I'm looking at this uh, this quiet end. There's a, a pretty classy-looking couple there. Yeah, they, they really fit in. No, I don't want to run our place down, but it is basically a beer bar. Yeah, it's pretty much T-shirts, jeans, and yeah. beer. Well, Some these, wine. 
These are attractive. It's an attractive couple, very well dressed. We're an attractive couple. Well, I'm we're not, not well dressed. I'm not saying we're unattractive, but these, <laughs> these people just look out of place. They do. They look very like Beverly Hills almost. Yeah. Plus, they're drinking martinis. I'll bet the bartender had to look up how to make them. Yeah, I bet he did. When's the last time he had to make a martini? I don't know. He probably does one a year. <laughs> Maybe that's an exaggeration. Well, and these just aren't your general hardcore martinis, are they? They're like fufu martinis. One looks chocolate or... Yeah, and one's got that pinkish tint, so it's probably a Cosmo or some variation of a Cosmo. Sure. I wonder what they think of the beer pong in the other room there. I wonder well, if they'd like to join in on that. Maybe they'd like to play. Maybe. I was going to ask them to take a break. I was going to buy the beer pongers some beer so they could take a break while we record. Then that's they a, can get back to it. It's still early. I mean, they'll be here long after we go home. Oh, they will. But that's a good idea. Okay. Well, All let's right. head on down. Take care of business here. Okay. Let's do it. So Janelle Potter was born in 1982, and she was the younger of Marvin and Barbara Potter's two daughters. And Janelle grew up protected and shielded from the outside world on the outskirts of Philadelphia. Now, at age 30 or so, she was an adult, but still living with her parents. And then they upped and moved to Mountain City, Tennessee. So this was in 2004. Barbara, the mom's elderly mother, lived in Mountain City, and Barbara was her power of attorney, so it made sense for them to move closer. Right. And Janelle wasn't 30 in 2004. She was 30 when all this went down. Right. Yeah. She was in so her 20s. So she was 20s. in her 20s still, but still an adult living with her parents with no job. So still very sheltered for her age. Very. Now, Janelle's father, Marvin, who is better known as Buddy, also had relatives in the area. Mountain City had a population of just over 2,300 people in 2004. Tiny place. Median household income was 31000 and the average home cost under 100000 Crime in Mountain City was virtually non-existent. Yeah, now some would say that the Potters never really felt at home in Mountain City. They weren't the outdoorsy types, so the Watuga Lake and nearby hiking on the Appalachian Trail didn't appeal to them. Besides, Janelle, Buddy, and Barbara had too many physical ailments for strenuous activities, so they were home most of the time. Now, Buddy had been a Marine, and he liked for everyone to know it. He wore a Marine ball cap, and at home he even had an entire wall with his military pictures, medals, and decorations displayed. Now, Buddy had joined the service when he was 18, and he had served in Vietnam. He'd suffered a back injury at work, and now he was on disability. Barbara had had a job in Pennsylvania, but she never got one after they moved to Tennessee. Yeah, now, Buddy's Vietnam or, or Marine record was a little bit of a fraud, actually. Yeah, well, he embellished it quite a bit, right? Well, more than embellished, yes. Okay. So there's a, there is a U.S. Marine who served in Vietnam and assisted his fellow injured Marines to safety. That Marine was PFC Raymond Clausen. It was not Marvin Buddy Potter. Wow, that's but really a shitty thing it, to do. It was Potter, who allegedly claimed Clausen's actions were his own. It was Potter who reportedly said those actions earned him the Navy Cross Medal the second highest military award for valor. Potter eventually got indicted in federal court for altering his military record to show awards he had never received and wearing those military medals and decorations without proper authorization. That is so frowned upon by the military. People really don't like that. No, because those medals and things are hard-earned. You know, that's nothing to they what, snub they're, your nose at. Is that a phrase? They're meaningful. They're meaningful, and if you try and take credit for it, you know, that's just terrible. That's like a betrayal of it, other it people is. in the military. Um, yeah. So the other other military people will really get pissed off about people sure. doing that stuff. And rightfully so, I think. So in addition to the Navy Cross, Potter allegedly altered his honorable discharge certificate to include awards of the Silver Star Medal, which is the third highest military award for valor, Bronze Star Medal, fourth highest award, Purple Heart, Airborne Kings, and Scuba Badge. He also reportedly took several photographs of himself wearing his uniform with unauthorized medals, badges, and decorations attached. Yeah, this guy didn't look like he was in good shape even. No, he, he looked like funny. he couldn't even walk from one room to another. Yeah. <laughs> but well, I, I guess he He did get... have health issues. He was on oxygen. I think he had emphysema. But, you yeah. know, Janelle had a variety of health issues too. She had what they called an auditory disability, which kept her in special ed classes all the way from kindergarten to graduation. 
and she was also poor, a very poorly managed diabetic. She suffered from anxiety as well, so she collected a monthly disability check. Now, when I say she was a poorly managed diabetic, do you want to talk about that a little bit as a pediatric endocrinologist, Dickie? Sure. Okay. I can do that. Because this is serious, life-threatening stuff. We know young people who have died by letting their diabetes go like this. Absolutely. Yeah, so tell us about it, because most people don't really know until you've experienced it in your life. Well, what Janelle had was, is considered type 1 diabetes, used to be called insulin-dependent diabetes. So these are people who lose the ability to manufacture insulin. It's different from type 2, which... Those people make plenty of insulin, but there's resistance to the action of insulin. So a totally different thing. But she had type 1. This is the bad one. Well, they're both bad. This is the worst the one. The worst one. Okay. So she can't make insulin, so she has to take shots. And probably at that time, it was shots. She might have had a pump. But anyway, she had to take insulin. And it's, it's potentially a really a fairly tricky management because you have to figure out how much insulin you need based on what activities you're going to be doing, based on what diet you're going to be eating. So you can, you can have pretty big swings in blood sugars. And if you're the one giving yourself the insulin, there's always the potential for overdosing or underdosing. And I think if, if you look at pictures of Janelle, as we did, I guess our listeners can't see pictures of her, well, they can go online and look if they want but, to. But there's pictures of her looking really gaunt and skinny, and there's pictures of her looking kind of fleshed out. So, big fluctuation in her weight. Right. Yes. So, typically, if she's not taking her insulin, uh, she's losing a ton of calories because insulin helps get glucose, sugar, into the cells where they power the cells, right? Right. Uh, so if you're not taking enough insulin or not taking any insulin, the cells have to figure out where else to get power. You're, you're losing all your glucose in your urine because it's not being utilized by the insulin. So you start breaking down protein and fats and can eventually become ketoacidotic. Which she did, and we'll get to that. i just like to bring up here is the potential for abuse with a teenager, young woman, teenage right. girl, because we all want to lose weight. All women pretty much want to lose weight, okay. especially at that so, age. So it is, it's pretty simple to figure out how to do that by manipulating your insulin dose. Sure. And by the same token, if you're taking extra insulin, you're going to gain weight. So it's, it's kind of a tricky place to fall. So Janelle would go into DKA quite often. What is DKA? Well, that's where you're not taking your insulin or you're taking inadequate amounts of insulin. And, and, and the body's breaking down fats and protein as energy sources. Yeah. So you're going to lose muscle mass. Uh, you're going to get pretty sick because ketoacidosis, you're tending to be more acidic in your blood. So this is serious. This You could be like in a coma this, from it. This is life-threatening or potentially life-threatening. And she's repeatedly getting this. Yeah, not healthy. But I think, as we'll see, I mean, Janelle had a host of issues. Yes. Not, not just the diabetes. No, and it's hard to say, did the diabetes contribute to her anxiety and her weirdness? Or did her weirdness just contribute to not controlling the diabetes? Well, probably both. Probably, although I would lean more towards her innate dysfunctional state uh, influencing her diabetes more. But I could really put a lot of this on her parents. Well, of course. Yes, because I think she was getting attention from her health issues. Now, she, they were real health issues. They were. What about this auditory disability? Have you ever heard of that? Sure. Oh, what is that? Basically, I mean, well, maybe it's just a weird term, but basically it means that your hearing is okay. So you hear the, the spoken word, but processing it, something goes wrong in your brain and you can't process what you're hearing. So you might say to me, go pick up your room. I hear that, but what my brain says is, go pee on the floor. I mean, that that's, drastic? No, that's a, that's a drastic <laughs> example. But, okay. But you don't, you don't process what you're hearing. So this could really put a person at a disadvantage socially. Absolutely. Okay. And, and we know that she had many social issues. Yes. And that's why I put a lot of the blame for this on the parents, even though Janelle seems to have been the instigator. 
The three adults, they lived in this small ranch-style home, Buddy, Barbara, and Janelle. None of them working, and Janelle never left the house without her parents or another adult. She was awkward socially, now that's putting it mildly. So this auditory disability made it difficult for her to communicate effectively, and her voice was kind of meek and high-pitched. Although when I saw her on a documentary, I didn't think her voice was as bad as it was described in the book we read. Yeah, it was, it was not as squeaky high-pitched as I was led to believe from the book. Right. Well, when they said it, I was thinking of like that Gypsy Rose Blanchard. Now, her voice was really high-pitched. Yeah. Yeah. Janelle's wasn't that bad. She did kind of talk like a 12-year-old. Mm -hmm. Now, her bedroom was filled with stuffed animals still. And by the time the family moved to Tennessee, Janelle's primary connection to the outside world had become social media. Because this is a small town. She's not the outdoorsy type. She's not really going anywhere. Besides, her parents won't let her go anywhere without them or some other adult they trust. Right. So, you know, this is all just some sickness in the house, I feel like. All these there, people here all the time. They've is. already got their issues. It's just like a bubbling kettle of dysfunction. For sure. So, and as you said, the thing that held Janelle's attention was the internet world. She talked in chat rooms. She had a MySpace page. <laughs> I remember that. And eventually became deeply involved with Facebook. Now, on Facebook, Janelle looked up old classmates and looked for new friends. She liked to post pictures of cute puppies, especially bulldogs. So that's okay to me. That's just immaturity, which she probably had like a developmental delay. This is a woman in her 20s. Yes, but she's extremely immature. Yeah, I guess to put it mildly and kindly, her social skills were pretty poor. Right. In public... She could make people uncomfortable by talking to them as if she knew them. Politely, they'd talk to her and allow her to hug them goodbye. After accepting her inevitable friend request on Facebook, many people were put off by her odd statements and postings. Many of her posts were fanatically religious. That's a turnoff. Well, Just give to my, some people. To most people. <laughs> yeah. Even religious people don't like that kind of fanaticism for the most part. Her self-description was somewhat delusional. She was probably terribly insecure, and she tried to make up for it by exaggerating her positive attributes. But she's not that intelligent, so it's so obvious. She doesn't realize how obvious she's being. Right. Right? Yeah. So Bill Payne, he was born in 1975. His sister Tracy was born two years after him. Now they grew up in the Mountain City area. Bill grew up to work at Parkdale Mills, a factory that made thread. He started right after high school and worked there throughout his life. Now, Tracy worked a variety of jobs. While Bill was in his 20s, he fathered a son named Justin, but he never married his son's mother. He was a sociable guy. He worked hard, and he played hard. He liked to get together with friends and family, drinking, dancing, and singing karaoke. So he was quite charming, and he did pretty well with the women, from what I read. Like many of his peers in rural Tennessee... Bill had used prescription narcotics recreationally. So that's unfortunate, but it does seem to be something that really happens, especially in rural in areas. Rural, rural areas. Rural America, yeah. yeah. Now, like many of his peers, he had problems with it. He'd never been looked at as a drug dealer, but he had used and exchanged painkillers within his circle of friends and acquaintances. So eventually he did recognize that it was a problem for him. And in his late 30s, he got treatment for opiate abuse. He got a prescription for Suboxone to overcome his desire for narcotics. And he went through a rough time. He was pretty sad because his son Justin moved to Florida with his mother. And despite all the problems, Bill had tried to maintain a fatherly role in Justin's life. So Suboxone, is that like methadone? Yeah. Okay. Works better, though. So it's, it's the medication of choice for opiate-addicted people. Uh, in an attempt to wean off of the opiates. Right. So things were looking up for Bill in 2009, when Billie Jean Hayworth began working at the Parkdale Mills factory. She was in the cleaning department, but he did see her there quite often. So she caught his eye early on, and Bill would leave his machine where he worked to visit Billie Jean in the area where she worked. Now, Billie Jean was cute. She was friendly. She was a brunette in her early 20s. Their workplace flirting quickly progressed into a serious relationship between the two. So Billy Jean moved into the house where Bill lived with his father, Billy Ray Payne Sr. 
Yeah, so he's in his mid to late 30s, and she's in her early 20s. There's an age difference. Bit of an age difference. Yes. And for those ages, that, that might be a fairly significant age difference. Well, when, yeah. When you're in your 20s and 30s. I mean, I think if you're in your 40s and 50s, it's less of an issue. Well, they seem to get along fine, though. But they did. I didn't find any problems in my research between the two of them. No, it doesn't look them. like it. I mean, the relationship apparently was good for was, both people. It was still a young relationship, to be fair. True. I mean, most relationships are good the first year. Right. But it, Bill drank less. He stayed off the pills. And then Billie Jean became pregnant in 2010. And in July 2011, they had a baby boy who they named Tyler. And friends said the two Bills, two Billies. Well, that's what I call them, the two, two Billies. Billies. So Billy, <laughs> Billy Payne and Billie Jean. Uh, they seem to be happy together. They spent time at home as a family rather than partying with friends. So that was a big change for Bill Payne yeah. from what his family and friends said. It really looks like he's settling down. Yeah, so he's kind of a late bloomer settling down in his late 30s. So, you know, they probably make a good couple if she's more mature for her age. Yeah. So Bill Sr., Bill's dad, was really happy for his son and happy to have this new grandchild. Billie Jean seemed like the perfect woman for Bill, and Bill Sr. was just really happy to have them with him. He didn't mind them living with him at all. So on January 30th, 2012, Bill Sr. said goodnight to his son's new family, went to bed feeling good about how well life seemed to be going for them. He got up the next morning, ready to go to work. He saw Billie Jean was up preparing a bottle for baby Tyler. Billie Jean asked Bill Sr. how his arm was doing because it had been bothering him. And he told her it was a little better. Off he goes to work. Seemed just like an average morning. Yeah, but just minutes after Bill Sr. left for work, intruders came into the house and killed the couple. They were both shot through the head. Bill also had his throat slashed. Later that morning, a family friend would find their bodies in the house. Yeah, Roy Stevens is that friend. He'd been having his mail sent to the Payne house because he and his wife were separated and they were having some marital difficulties. Right, so that way he knew he could get his mail. <laughs> right. He went into the house, walked straight to the shelf where his mail was kept. And he's expecting to see Bill and Billy around the house getting started on the day. Yeah, this is early morning. Yeah, and yeah. people should be up and getting ready to go to work. Right, because Bill did have to go to work that day. But the house was quiet. So Roy walked down the hall. He saw Bill lying on his bed, walked over to him and touched his arm. It was ice cold. That was quite shocking for him, right? Because you don't expect to find your friend dead. No. And it's then really... he saw the bullet hole through Bill's eye, and he had a gaping neck wound. So that's more than shocking. Yes. Really traumatic. Then he walked further down the hall, and he saw a scene even worse than what he had just seen. There's Billie Jean covered in blood. Seven-month-old Tyler was in her arms, lying against her chest. Yeah, so the baby was still and covered in blood. So Roy was just kind of frozen in the doorway until he noticed that Tyler was breathing. So he ran over to Billie Jean, who was obviously dead, and picked up Tyler. Now the baby was eerily quiet and didn't squirm. He was probably exhausted from crying for hours. It had been hours in his dead mom's arms. Well, a, f a couple, a few, not hour, not half a day hours. Well, no, but this is a baby. A couple hours of screaming is going to... Yeah. Now, Roy ran out to his car, and his wife was out in the car waiting for him. Even though they were separated, I guess they were kind of an off-and-on type of couple. Yeah. So she came into the house, and she called 911. So this type of crime was really unheard of in Mountain City. The house was quickly surrounded by police cars as family members frantically tried to contact Bill and Billy. When news of the murders actually became public, the community was very stunned. The story dominated the local news, of course. People who had never locked a door in their lives began to lock their doors and sleep with a gun beside their bed. The thing was, though, when police began their interview process, the name of one family kept coming up, the Potters. Uh-huh. Potter family. They're connected to this. Yes. Now, there is a sister of Janelle who didn't live in the house, and before Janelle was born, her sister Christy was an only child for six years. After Janelle came along, all of the parental attention seemed to move to her. Barbara and Buddy seemed to develop a singular focus on Janelle, according to Christy, and Janelle's special needs. 
As Christy grew into her teens, her relationship with her parents became worse, and Barbara seemed totally devoted to Janelle only. She became delusional, irrational, and difficult to live with. This is Barbara I'm talking about. Janelle began to get a reputation starting in junior high as a real weird kid. She had her health complaints, some of which were real, but probably not all. She was also very confrontational. She ended up having arrests and court dates related to verbal and physical attacks she'd made against other students by the time she was in high school. But the thing was, Barbara and Buddy always took her side, so she was never held accountable. I never got any help. And we know these kinds of parents. Oh, yes. No matter what their kids do, they can do no wrong. And they're really doing a disservice to their kids, I think. They are. I mean, the, the short-sightedness is that they think they're protecting the child. But the reality is the opposite. Exactly. Because I think your job as a parent is to get your kids so they can function out in the world without you. You know, it's like pushing the birds out of the nest. Right. And if you're going to cling to them, and I mean, she was super, she was super dependent on her parents. That she was. Now, after high school, Christy got an associate's degree and moved into her own apartment. So she's so, totally different, so very here's independent. A totally different person. Right. After she moved out, she and her parents were more estranged. She never spoke to Janelle. She tried once in a while to rebuild a relationship with her parents and her sister, but it always ended badly. At the time when Bill Payne and Billie Jean were murdered, Christy had absolutely no relationship with the Potters, any member of the family. And good for her, because I, well, I can't imagine growing up in that. I think she's recognized the toxicity of that family. Well, it's good that and, she did. And distanced herself from there. Yeah. Well, Janelle was actually introduced to Bill Payne before he was even with Billie Jean. Bill's sister Tracy had felt sorry for Janelle and made efforts to befriend her and take her out on some day trips. So they went rock climbing with Bill, and Janelle may have developed a crush on Bill from the time they first met. Now, Bill was not romantically interested in Janelle, so Tracy introduced Janelle to her cousin, Jamie Curd, thinking they might be a good match. So Jamie and Janelle, neither one of them had had a boyfriend or a girlfriend before. And Jamie liked Janelle. They seemed to hit it off. The thing was that Barbara and Buddy didn't approve of Jamie. You know, he just wasn't a good enough for their daughter. Well, he was pretty rough around the edges. Yes. Uh, liked to drink and party and stuff. And he was older. And he was a few years older. So Janelle actually ran off to elope with him early on. So they were having a secret romantic relationship. But her parents actually went after her and brought her back. And they forbid her from seeing him. So she's about 30 years old. That's just strange. That's not healthy. <laughs> no. But, you know, Jamie was gradually able to get in good with Barbara and Buddy. And they began to consider him a good family friend. But it seems like they were in denial about the relationship between Jamie and Janelle. Because it was kind of obvious. So I think they just didn't want to believe it. I, I think that's true. And I think that the... Uh relationship with Barbara and Buddy was because they looked at Jamie as being someone they could manipulate and get to do what they wanted. So you think they were thinking that early on? That early? I do. That's interesting. Well, things seemed to go well for a while, and Jamie and Janelle secretly texted. He actually, what he did is he bought her one of those pay-as-you-go phones and threw it out in the yard. And then it, when her parents weren't looking, she went out in the yard and found it. So this is just sad. Why, why? Just why is that? That's so 30 weird. 30 years old. Yeah, that's pathetic. But it seemed to be going well. They were happy with that because neither one of them was very experienced. So even this was more than they were used to romantically, right? Right. And it was interesting because after the murders, police discovered that Janelle had actually sent some nude selfies to Jamie. So I think there's a possibility that they did have sex at some point. I think so. Yeah, I do too. Inside of his car, they would find cards and letters from Janelle, and they were all very much like the two of them were in love. They were deeply in love. So I just wonder, maybe it would have been better off if the parents had just let Janelle and Jamie be together. Maybe none of this shit would have happened. Maybe not. Hindsight's excellent, right? Well, that's what I think these parents are way at fault for this. Way, way at fault. Well, especially the mother. I'm, I'm putting... Well, the, but the, the father... Well, they both are. Well, but the, the father 
did what the mother wanted him to do. Yes, but he did bad things that he should have known better. Well, yes, he should have. Right. But Mom, Barbara, was running the place. Right. So what about Chris? He came into the picture after Billy Payne and Billy Jean moved in together. Coincidentally or not? Well, we'll see. They move in together, they have a baby, and all of a sudden this Chris is writing to Janelle and Barbara, and Chris is a CIA agent. And Chris thinks Janelle's pretty and sweet and kind. No one saw him in person, but Barbara and Jamie emailed with him quite a bit. Oddly, his focus in life seemed to be on Janelle and her Facebook squabbles with some of the local young women. And this didn't seem odd to Barbara, I guess. Well, I guess not. So Chris wrote to Jamie and Barbara through Janelle's email address. Well, he's in the CIA, so he probably has to, you know, do that. Yeah. <laughs> he also had access to her Facebook account. He never used any online account of his own, just Janelle's. Yes. There are hundreds of emails flowing back and forth between Barbara, Jamie, and Chris. Now, Chris's emails and texts, he sure doesn't sound like a CIA agent. No, unless he all his training was for naught. Right. Plus his high school education. Well, he wrote like an uneducated homicidal maniac. I like that description. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. He, he used really vile language. Right. Seemed Hated to... people, didn't hesitate to kill people. Yeah, he was always talking about killing people because that's what CIA agents do, I guess. Yeah, he could do it legally because he was a CIA agent. Right. But the, the grammar that he used, this, this is just... <laughs> anybody reading the emails and would say, you got to be kidding me. I know. It's clear from his emails to anyone with normal reasoning and intelligence that Chris had not been trained as any sort of federal employee. He wasn't trained enough to work at the DMV. He misspelled words, and he transposed letters over and over again. And Chris also had a tendency to keep the E in words where he added I-N-G. So taking was spelled T-A-K-E-I-N-G, and caring was spelled C-A-R-E-I-N-G. And this wasn't a typo because it was consistent in all his emails. So he's very angry and he's very ignorant, which is a very bad combination in anybody. And nobody thought it odd <laughs> that Chris seemed preoccupied. Chris, the CIA agent, seemed preoccupied with Janelle and her small town life. No, because everything he wrote concerned Janelle. He didn't talk about sports or events of the world. All he talked about was Janelle and killing, pretty much. Now, Janelle's problems were his problems. He took them on. Her enemies were those he wanted dead. She had the best taste. She was the prettiest. And his life was pretty much just revolving to keep her safe and happy in the world. Which probably made sense to Barbara, because her life is pretty much surrounding Janelle, too. These are very delusional people. Terribly. So Barbara and Jamie wrote back to Chris like he was real, apparently never considering. Maybe Chris could be Janelle. It's Janelle's email. It sounds like Janelle. But they didn't. So they're being catfished from Barbara's own computer. Pretty remarkable. It is. Janelle had her own computer? No, she shared it with Barbara. Right. So <laughs> so there's one computer in this household. Yes. And if we haven't found out, we'll find out that Buddy, the father, was computer illiterate, so he never touched the computer. Right. So it was Barbara and Janelle sharing the computer. Yeah, so they had like a room where the computer was. So you might have Janelle typing stuff, and I'm going to give it away now. Janelle is Chris. <laughs> So you might have Janelle typing a letter from Chris to Barbara. Then she goes to make herself a sandwich, and Barbara goes to use the computer, reads Chris's email, which Janelle has just typed, and writes back. Back to Chris. It is so twisted. And Janelle will read the email address to Chris. Right. And when looking through the material here, I kept having to remind myself, Chris isn't a real person. He's Janelle. Because it's yeah. very confusing. <laughs> it is. <laughs> And it's unbelievable. If it was fiction, no one would believe it. They'd say, that's just not realistic. Well, what do you say? Truth is stranger than fiction? Yes, that I mean, definitely applies here. This, this whole time, I'm, I'm just stunned <laughs> by the stupidity of these people. It is. It's almost annoying. After a while, the book got annoying because I couldn't <laughs> read their letters anymore. Just the, the ignorance and the delusion are just overwhelming. Yeah, aren't they? So most of us are familiar with catfishing, like we mentioned earlier, after the movie and then the MTV series Catfish. 
So by creating alternate online identities, Janelle added excitement to her life. She'd created several online personas, actually. There was Chris, there was Matt Potter, who was a brother, Dan White, Tim, and Brian. So these are all men, and they all have one thing in common. They care very deeply about Janelle. That's right. They were very protective of her, like older loving brothers that she had always wanted. So good for her, huh? <laughs> yeah. She's got what she wanted. But... but the truth was, they didn't exist. None of these guys existed. No. These are all well, products of Janelle's imagination. Only in her head and then in the heads of other people. Right. Like Barbara. No one had ever seen them or spoken with them, of course. They were known only through Janelle Potter's online accounts. They didn't even have separate accounts. So it's not even that clever. Right. Well, right? like I said, the, the stupidity is astounding. <laughs> yeah. None of this could have happened without some stupidity mixed in there with delusions. Right. So Chris, though, he was the primary guy. And Chris had a really adventurous life. He traveled the world. He had this exciting job as a hero for his country. He had been married, of course, to his one true love, but he was sadly a widow. That was okay, though, because he was far too busy for a love life. Chris was happy to travel the world, killing bad people. And he traveled with his three Great Danes and his Yorkie by his side. And, of course, he was good-looking. Well, what else? It sounds kind of like a Harlequin romance character. It does, doesn't it? It does. Although the Great Danes and the Yorkie is even a little too much for Harlequin. Yeah. Three, <laughs> three Great Danes. Yes, very specific. So this, this could present some difficulties in traveling. These, you would think so. These are three big dogs. How does he stay, you know, under the radar? Right. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I guess we should stop making fun of things. I don't know. It's fun. Okay. We're making fun of the idiots that committed these horrible crimes. Of course we're not laughing at the crime itself. Okay. So despite his demanding schedule, Chris continued to stay in touch with Janelle. He came to Johnson County, Tennessee from time to time to keep an eye on Janelle's enemies. Well, yeah, that's good of him. He followed the enemies. He confronted the local police about Janelle's issues with these people. If they didn't listen, he would kill them. Sure. He would never mention the policeman he killed but by name, but he would write to Barbara, I got one, Mom. Ugh, that just makes me sick. That's why I couldn't read all those letters, because, you know, Barbara is obviously thinking Chris is real, or she wants to. And they get so close that he calls her Mom, and she calls him Son. Yeah. What the hell? It didn't seem to bother her at all when Chris wrote terrible things. He often wanted someone to die even referring to killing a baby a couple of times. She never admonished him for these thoughts. Barbara felt like she was familiar with CIA, CIA killing tactics, of course, because her husband, Buddy, had once been in the CIA. More bullshit. Yes. Oh, this is full of bullshit. Now, in 2007, four years before the murders of Billie Jean and Bill Payne, Buddy had visited the Johnson County Sheriff's Office. He explained to the sheriff that he had a history with the CIA and was expecting to be reactivated as an employee at any time. He was just waiting on his notice of where to report. He said that he had killed in the past, but only legally in the line of duty. So he says that he stopped by the sheriff's office as a courtesy call, <laughs> just, just to let him know that there what's, was, going on here? what's going on and that there's going to be a CIA guy in their midst. Well, this guy carried a gun even when he was working on the yard. Yeah, yeah. With, with bullets in a belt. Yeah. So he had mentioned his CIA activity to everyday people in his life, too. And Barbara even bragged about it. And Janelle liked to talk about it. So this is probably where Janelle's idea of Chris was born, don't you think? I think that's entirely possible. Because she's not that creative on her own. Her mother seems like to get all hot and excited thinking that Buddy's the CIA guy. Because in I think it was an interview in 2020 when they asked about Buddy and his CIA and... The, the interviewer kind of tongue-in-cheek said, it's like living with James Bond, huh? <laughs> yeah. And she said, oh, I just always thought of him as a gentle giant or something. Right. These are just weird folks. These are more than weird folks. Yeah, right. So in one early email between Barbara and Chris, Barbara wrote that she understood the intricacies of his CIA <laughs> work as Buddy's longtime wife. Sure. So she's been through it with him. Sure. Tell us what she wrote. She wrote, as long as you do the right thing for mankind, then you will not be judged badly. If it is like Buddy did, you are helping others by getting rid of the bad. I understand what you do fully, if it is like Buddy did. 
I worry about when you retire, though. Don't let it ever get you down, Chris. God. Yeah, I know. That's all you can do is shake your head. And she reportedly wrote to Chris asking him to convince his superiors to give Buddy CIA identification. Chris always said, I'm working on it, or it's in the works. Yeah, she wrote that again and again. Again and again and again. So on March 1st, 2011, and I don't want to get too much into reading these emails, but I'm just going to give an example here. So this is what Barbara wrote to Chris in March. Hi, Chris. Bud was wondering when he'd be contacted to meet up and pick up his ID that you spoke of some time ago. Just for your info, he's home every day now. He can come alone because Janelle will be home with me. So she really <laughs> thinks this is going to happen. Yeah. And why does someone have to be home with Janelle? It's so bizarre. And the exchange went on for months as Barbara asked almost daily about Buddy's CIA ID. And Chris told her it was stuck in bureaucratic red tape, of course. He did say that Buddy was in the computer, though. So can I just say these potters are some really sick people? They, they are some really strange sick people. So speaking of sick people, we all think we can spot them. But can you? Are you a good detective? How would you even know? Check out Hunt a Killer. It's the first ever interactive investigation delivered straight to your door every month. It's like Dexter and True Detective without the blood spatter or the cut-up beer cans. Nice well, reference. Thank you. Log in to HuntAKiller.com and apply for membership. They only accept 200 members a day. Once you're accepted, you'll receive an invitation with a private link to complete your registration. Your first episode ships that very first day with no shipping charges. You'll receive clues, correspondence, and physical items that put you into the mind of a serial killer. Now it's your job to decipher and investigate to unravel the case. Warning. Hunt a killer may lead to improved problem solving, but also may lead to sleepless nights. Now, Hunt a Killer has been featured in BuzzFeed, Fast Company, and the Washington Post. Now, the editors of Bustle are writing monthly about the journey, so you can keep up on that, too. Hunt a Killer is building an actual inside community of hunters where members communicate in a private Facebook group. Like tens of thousands of hunters, I'm a member. If investigating isn't your thing, you probably know a crime geek who would love this as a gift. Now, best of all, to help support our show, Hunt a Killer is offering a 10% discount for our listeners. So just go to www.huntakiller.com and use the code BREWERY to get 10% off. I'm there. It's really cool. Fun thing to do. It is. Now, Janelle's parents were very involved in her life, of course. We know that. To the point of dysfunction. Barbara shared a Facebook account with Janelle, and when Janelle began to complain about being harassed by Billie Jean and her friends, Lindsay and Tara, Barbara became very protective and angry, and she lashed out. So, I think Barbara's like the mom in the neighborhood. Did you have a mom in your neighborhood where you were out doing fun kid stuff, and then one of the kids, who would be the Janelle in the group, would get upset? Oh, this wasn't fair, and they'd go get their mom. And then Barbara's the mom who would come out with her kid and yell at all the other kids like they're heathens. Right. What are you doing to my little Janelle? Mm -hmm. We had a mom like that. And it wasn't good for the kid because we all made fun of her. Yeah, Tommy and Mikey's mother were like that when I was a kid growing up. Yeah. She'd come out and threaten us, basically. Right, and then you'd all laugh and make fun of him. Yeah. Yeah. It, it made it even worse. <laughs> sure it does. So that's how I picture Barbara was when Janelle was younger. So I kind of got off track there, but... You know, I think most people can relate to that type of person when you're a kid, at least. For sure. So Janelle's complaining about these girls. She's complaining about Billie Jean, Lindsay, and Tara. And one day, a local gas station clerk actually witnessed Barbara and Janelle verbally abusing Billie Jean at the pump. And Billie Jean was really shaken up. Also, her baby Tyler was in the car. So when the clerk came out to see what was going on, Barbara and Janelle sped away. Billie Jean was visibly shaking when they drove away, and she told the clerk who it was. Eventually, Billie Jean and Lindsay filed a harassment complaint against Janelle. Now, the case was thrown out for lack of evidence, and I think that was just poor evidence gathering by the young women. Right. Because they're certainly, they could have gotten a restraining order. It seems like they could have. I think they just didn't put things together as well as they could have. They, they, they had a witness. Yeah, they probably needed a lawyer or someone a little more savvy. Yeah. But afterwards, this is the funny part, Barbara wrote to Chris that they had seen CIA agents watching over Janelle at the courthouse. 
One of them had even given Janelle a thumbs up. Way to go, kid. Yeah, now, I have a couple questions about that. Okay. I mean, if, if Barbara can spot these CIA agents, they must not have been very good at their jobs. Well, maybe Barbara's just very insightful. Blend into the background. Yeah, but Barbara's a smart cookie in and, Barbara's head. And then the other part of it is, why would you have CIA agents watching over Janelle? Oh, because they're always watching over her. You didn't know? Thank you. Yeah, Chris knows everything that's going on in that town. And if Chris is busy killing people, you know, across the country or in another country, maybe in Europe or something, then he has other guys who keep an eye on her. It's kind of a, a paranoid delusion in a way, isn't it? Oh, for sure. Now, Janelle clearly had hate for Billie Jean and Billie Jean's friends. After, Janelle started writing on Facebook that she wished Billie Jean and that damn baby would die. And then Janelle began to claim that they were driving by, threatening to blow up her dad's truck and throwing rocks at the house. So the police actually did come out and find rocks, right? They did. They found three rocks. One said Billie Jean. Well, that's not subtle. One said Bill Payne. <laughs> and one said, I am your huckleberry. Now, I had to look that up. Yeah, because I didn't know what that I mean, meant. A huckleberry is a fruit, right? I don't know. But according to the Historical Dictionary of American Slang, I'm your huckleberry means I'm just the man you're looking for. So is that her way of saying that Bill Payne wants to be with Janelle? Is that what she's trying to say? Let's let's go back. Let's assume Janelle did this because that's where my mind's at. Is well, that where your mind's of at? Of course. Okay. So if Janelle takes these rocks and she writes those two names and then she writes, I am your huckleberry, is she trying to say that Bill Payne really loves her? That would be one definition. That'd be one way to look at it. The, the other thing I was thinking is that maybe Chris did one of the rocks. <laughs> uh, he's he's the man he's for the, the job. He's the huckleberry. Ah, but then who's throwing the rocks with the names on them? Well, yeah, that's it. The two Billies are doing that? Allegedly. Right, I'm talking about allegedly. Is yeah. that what she's saying happened? Yeah. Okay. So but, that's not even very believable. That's weird. No. But I, I think my alternative view isn't terrible, that I'm your huckleberry is Chris, I'm the man for the job, and Billy Jean and Billy Payne are the victims that he's going to take care of for her, for Janelle. Oh, so in that scenario, Chris threw all three rocks? So Chris is the rock guy. Okay. The way I took it was that her enemies were throwing rocks at her house yeah. that ended on the lawn. Right. I think that's, that's how it was taken, or meant to be taken, by the police. So that was what she wanted the police to think. Yeah. The but huckleberry I'm, I'm thinking, thing is just way weird. It is. And, and like you said, you know, you look up the definition of I'm your huckleberry. I'm your man. So, yeah, I guess if we're going to think that Billy Payne was behind it, then he's saying that he's the one for Janelle and, and he doesn't want to be with Billy Jean. Yeah, which we know that wasn't true. Right. So there's also this Matt Potter. There's not only Chris, right? She has other personas. Right. Brother Matt. Brother Matt, who's also very protective. So... In April 2011, Matt Potter wrote, All three of these girls are no good whores and sell drugs and drink. And if you ever hit Janelle, Lindsay, your ass better watch out. She don't even know you, and you all always have to pick on her and hurt her family. Why don't you go back to fucking hell where you come from? Two other friends of Janelle chimed in, Dan White and Kelly, to agree with Matt and to berate Lindsay, Tara, and Billie Jean again. There's these multiple insults which are really vile. Also talking about them being HIV positive. So Chris wrote emails to Jamie saying he was afraid Janelle would kill herself because these three women continued to torment her. So if you look at that, that could really be striking because it seems like she's manipulating Jamie to participate in this murder for her to protect her. Right. Now, have they gotten to the point where they're starting to think of killing people? Oh, yes. I think that happened early on. Chris was talking a lot about how he'd like to kill them. Even the baby had been mentioned. Right. So I'm not sure when the Buddy really got involved in that idea. But I think Chris talked to Barbara and Jamie. And then we'll find out that Barbara was printing up emails and things and showing them to Buddy, who didn't use a computer. Yeah. Now, the crime scene where the murders happened, it revealed that there was no robbery. There were some drugs and cash and valuable items left behind. So it seemed that the only goal of the intruder was to kill them. And the only enemies anyone could come up with were the Potters. Well, that's for sure. So after the murders, police went to the Potters' house 
and they interviewed Barbara, Buddy, and Janelle, all together. Now, don't you like to try to separate them and do them individually? I would think so. But maybe at this point, this is, this is pretty soon after the murders. Maybe they're just trying to gather facts. So Janelle denied ever threatening Billy Jean online, but she didn't hesitate to speak ill of her. She told the police that Billy Jean had been harassing the crap out of her. She denied that Jamie was anything more than a good friend of the family. Her Facebook page had been wiped clean. So that's suspicious. Isn't it? Yeah. Here's, here's a person who lives on Facebook. Right. So the policeman asks her, well, what do these women have against you? Why are they harassing you? And Janelle actually said they were jealous because they said that she was too pretty. So yeah. this kind of struck the policeman as, what? <laughs> uh-huh. Exactly. Not that she was hideous, but she wasn't too pretty. Nope. No. So when police talked to Jamie Curd, and they considered him to be an odd duck. Yeah, yeah. And then Bill and Jamie had recently had a falling out. So police talked to Jamie Curd, and he was considered to be an odd duck. That's for sure. And Bill and Jamie had recently had a falling out. Now, they, weren't they, they were related they somehow? They were cousins, cousins, and they actually right. grew up together and got yeah. along pretty well. Of course, each of them had some drug and drinking problems. Right. And so what do you suppose the falling out was? Oh, well, the falling out was over Janelle, because Bill had been trying to warn Jamie, that girl's cray-cray, stay yeah, away. stay away from her. And Jamie, you know, now he's in love with Janelle, because yeah. he's never had anybody, you know. So this is a big deal to him. Plus, he's getting all this bullshit from supposedly Chris. So he's getting all this bad intel about Bill. And then Bill warns him to stay away from Janelle. So the two had a falling out over that. And, you know, let's just say Jamie's not the super brightest. No. Kind of naive, at least. You can see from his interviews and stuff. Yeah. Now, two days after the homicide, Jamie gets brought to the police station to be interviewed. When asked about the problem between what the problem was between his cousin, Bill, and himself, Jamie said there'd been a Facebook feud between Billy Jean and Janelle. And Jamie kept insisting that he and Janelle were only friends, not romantically involved. Right, so this whole feud between Janelle and Billy Jean on Facebook kind of branched out, metastasized, if you will, to create problems with all right. these people. She's dragging people in. When in reality, there was no such feud. It's nothing. Right. It's really just Janelle jealous that Billy Jean, Is you know, has a Bill. baby and a, you know, has a life basically. Yeah. So that's where I really blame the parents for that, but. But police had heard from others that Janelle and Jamie were more than friends. Tracy had fixed them up, and they had continued a secret romantic relationship. Bill had warned Jamie to stay away from Janelle, because she and her family were crazy, right? And after that, Jamie refused to speak to Bill. So when brought in for questioning, though, Jamie agreed to take a polygraph. And he showed deception, so he was confronted about that. And police didn't think that Jamie had actually killed Billie Jean and Bill Payne, but they thought he had been there when it happened. Police told Jamie that they knew Buddy was responsible for the murders, and he finally admitted that Buddy did shoot the couple as he stood watch at the front door, actually. Now, that's just, that's his cousin. I know. That's sad. That, that's cold. It's very cold. So, Jamie said that he rode to the Payne house with Buddy. This is, the hit is on. Right, right. Buddy gave him a gun, told him to stand at the door. So Jamie heard Buddy shoot Bill. Billy Jean then came screaming into the front room. She saw Jamie at the door, turned around, ran into the baby's room. Buddy followed her into that room, and Jamie heard another shot. So Buddy's pretty heartless. I mean, we could say that he was manipulated by Barbara and Janelle, and that's true. But still, to go in there and kill a woman who's going into her baby's room. Yeah. That's very heartless. Well, he's doing it for his daughter. Yeah, I don't know about that. I mean, they could move away if it was that serious. Just move. As Jamie's being interviewed by the police, he says out of nowhere, is the CIA here? Yeah, and the police say, the hell is he talking about? Yeah, they don't know you what know, he's this, talking this about. This is just totally out of left field. So right. they didn't really grasp the significance of it at the time. No, but don't you think Jamie probably thought that Chris from the CIA would be coming in and getting him out of there? Well, yeah. Because this is a legal killing. It is. So according to Chris, the murders were helping the town. Janelle, as Chris, had offered official support from the government. 
for the killings of Billie Jean and Bill Payne. So Jamie agreed to call the Potter House and try and get Buddy to talk, and Barbara answered the phone. So before she gave the phone to Buddy, she asked him if he had a lie detector test and if he had passed, and he said yes. So I guess the police must have told him to say that. Sure. So then Jamie asked Buddy if he had gotten rid of everything from Bill's house, and Buddy said yes. Now Jamie said that that made him feel better, and Buddy agreed. So now they've got kind of the, uh, not a confession, but they kind of have proof that Buddy's in on this. Yeah. That they they can use. They have the scenario figured out. Right. Now they just got to fill it in. Right. So the next morning they bring Buddy in. They arrest him and question him, right? Right. Now, Buddy didn't know that his phone call from Jamie had been recorded. Found out that there was a record of it. He caved in and confessed. Caved quite easily. Yeah. Didn't he? Boom. Yeah. He told police about threats from the victims against his family. He said he was protecting his family. So, I mean, he did kind of seem to believe that. He did. But he was being fed by his wife and daughter. Right. But I would argue, even if you think your family's at risk, this isn't how you work with it. You don't go in and kill people. Of course not. I don't think that's too off the wall to say that. No, I think that's what most reasonable people would suggest. Okay. So police wanted to know where Buddy had gotten this idea that his family was threatened, and then they recorded his call to Barbara. This was interesting. So in his call to Barbara, he tells her that he was involved in the murders. Buddy seemed to be crying and covering up for Barbara. But Barbara was in an alibi mode. She told him that he wasn't himself. He needed to think more because she remembers he was with her that morning. So she doesn't want him to confess. Right. And she's providing him with the alibi. Sure. So she seems more guilty than he does in this whole thing. Yeah. Or more of the evil person, I guess. Certainly not a normal reaction. No, 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 no. And the police are getting more suspicious of Barb. And they started to think that Barbara and Janelle might be behind the whole murder plot. Right. Investigators wanted to know more about who had persuaded Buddy that Janelle's life was in danger. So this is going to lead to the core of the issue. Now we're going to find out. They reviewed the call between Jamie and Barbara, and Barbara had said that she'd received an email from Chris saying that Buddy had been arrested. So Chris is still involved here. Police decided to check if the CIA did have any involvement in the murders, because, you know, you've got to rule these things out. And after all, Buddy had claimed that he was in the CIA before. Now, Buddy and Jamie were arrested for murder, but the motive was kind of uncertain other than this whole protection thing. Now, Buddy claimed that he had to kill Billie Jean and Bill because there was a plot to kill Janelle. And he was graphic about this. There'd been, Janelle had written that people were threatening to rape her, to... Dismember. Dismember her. Right. Yeah. So... He was crying about it, too. It seemed like he was really believing this. He was. And then, what did Jamie do? He recanted his confession. Right. He said he wasn't at the house that day. Oh, nothing to do with it. Now, he had a public defender, so prosecutors couldn't get him to talk to them anymore. No. They returned to the Potter home, the investigators did. Barbara went to the table and started to rip up printed pictures, which were pictures of Billie Jean and her friends that had been pulled from Facebook. They had captions on them like Billy Whore and Sluts. Now, in Buddy's pickup, there was even more material. Numerous trash bags of shredded documents. Now, don't you think if you're going to go to the trouble of shredding everything, you dispose of them? Don't just throw them in the bed of the pickup? Yeah. But anyway, (laughs) these were emails going back and forth between Janelle's email address and Barbara's. So people in the same house. On the same computer. Yeah, yeah. Investigators spent hours going through these and actually taping the shredded emails back together. So I give big credit to whoever had the patience to do that. Now the name... Talk about time consuming. Oh my gosh, tedious. The name Chris popped up in numerous emails. He seemed very fixated on Janelle Potter and her life. He told Barbara and Bill Payne... He told Barbara that Bill Payne and Billie Jean were drug dealers who were killing people, and Janelle was their next target. Then they saw emails where Chris told Jamie he was afraid that Janelle would kill herself if these threats didn't stop. So this seemed like very significant manipulation, just to get Jamie to participate in these killings. Absolutely. I'm sure there's a lot we don't even know about that was talked about in that little house. Oh, 
Can Wouldn't only you love imagine. to have been a fly on the wall? Yep. Now, it seemed clear to police that Chris, who was the purported CIA agent, that his emails had created the motive for the murders. But then they think, why would a CIA agent be involved in Janelle's email dispute? Yeah. Good point. That's a good question. Police found an email with Chris's last name as Jaden. They looked for a Chris Jaden, and they found one in Delaware. He worked for the police, but he was not a CIA agent. But he was a murder suspect. Well, Janelle had made him one. Right. So police went and questioned him and showed him the emails and the pictures associated with the emails. So there were pictures of him, and some were actually pictures of him that had been found on the Internet, and some were just guys that looked a little bit like him. So there was one with a guy who looked like Chris in a Ferrari with the caption, Chris with his Ferrari. And Chris said, well, I never even owned a Ferrari. And Chris is just like a police deputy or something, an yeah, officer. Just a regular guy. Regular guy, yeah. So then the police decided someone had taken Chris's identity, his online identity. They showed Chris a picture of Janelle, and Chris recognized her from high school. He had known her as an acquaintance back then. He said she was an odd girl. They'd never had a relationship, and he hadn't spoken to her since high school. So that's like, what, 15 years? 12, 15 years yeah. ago? Yeah, but she might have had a thing for him, I guess. Another one that she was fixated on. So investigators spoke to Christy, Janelle's older sister, about Janelle, and they didn't know what her opinion would be, if she'd be on their side or what. But Christy told police about Janelle's history of disputes with other girls, in school, Janelle would fake seizures and feigning spells for attention. She often had these unrequited crushes on boys, and when she was rejected, she would lash out at other girls. She would claim that girls were jealous of her because she was just too damn pretty. So Chris had been one of her unrequited crushes, and Bill Payne had been another. Despite Janelle's difficulty in making friends, she became very active on social media after she moved to Tennessee. Yeah, but she had trouble keeping Facebook friends, too. Well, yeah, because she posted all this negative shit about people. Right. And Barbara and Janelle were threatening Billie Jean and other young women. Then Janelle would claim that her account had been hacked and it wasn't really her. So this is when Chris entered the picture and really fueled the fire. Barbara became very angry and desperate, and Buddy didn't use the computer, so she printed these emails and pictures and she showed them to him. So computer records from the emails confirmed that the Chris emails had come from the Potter's computer. Aha. Uh -huh. Whoa. Janelle had invented Chris in order to manipulate her parents and Jamie. The IP addresses all came back to the same computer. Yeah, but proving that they all came from the same computer wasn't enough in a criminal case. Investigators no. would have to prove that Janelle had actually written the emails. Right, have to do that. Right. It's not enough to just say it's this, this computer. No. Because it is kind of public domain. People could have gotten conceivably they into the have. house and done that stuff. Well, and she as, made all these claims of hacking. As unlikely as it sounds. Well, it's very unlikely. Right. So the lead prosecutor, Dennis Brooks, and by the way, he's the one that wrote the book, Too Pretty to Live, about this case. He contacted a Dr. Leonard at Hofstra University. Dr. Leonard was an expert in forensic linguistics. And he could identify patterns in human language by looking at writing samples. So that's pretty interesting little niche she's got. Isn't it? So you just get writing samples and you can identify patterns in human language. Sure. Which doesn't seem like it would be too hard with this group. No, they had very distinctive patterns. They sure did. Now, one of the cool things, I thought, Dr. Leonard needed typed writing samples from Janelle and Barbara to compare to the emails. They came up with a plan. Prosecutor Brooks asked the women to type out thorough written statements on the harassments they were receiving. And when they did that, Dr. Leonard saw definite overlaps in the linguistic patterns between the Janelle and the Chris emails. So this basically gave the prosecutor proof that Janelle was the author of Chris emails. And he can have an expert testify to that, so that helps. Right. Now, I guess proving that Barbara had written her damning emails was a bit trickier. But she was known to write these incredibly long passages that said really very little. To convict her of murder, the prosecutor would have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she had solicited, directed, aided, or attempted to aid in these murders. 
so there was no outright solicitation of the murders in the emails. But Barbara definitely endorsed Chris's plans to murder people. And Barbara was the conduit between Chris and Buddy. Right. So investigators believe that Janelle had used Jamie and her parents to do her bidding. They decided that they could make a case against Barbara and Janelle as the masterminds behind the murders. Yeah, now aside from her writing patterns, the emails told investigators a lot about Janelle Potter. She was paranoid and obsessed about people who she perceived were against her. Now a certain person just driving down her street past her house could be interpreted as a threat. And many of her traits were similar to her mother Barbara. According to her older sister, Christy, Barbara would instantly react to any conflict by saying that she wanted that person dead or she wanted to kill that person. Just the smallest little dispute, and she's like, I'm going to kill that bitch. Yeah. So, wacko beans. Mm-hmm. So when Jamie realized that the Chris emails had started after Billie Jean got pregnant, he became convinced that Janelle had manipulated him. Well, better late than never. But what a horrible thing to realize. You know, how do you live with that? Yeah. That you did this to your cousin and the little baby not having any parents. So I would think there's some guilt there. Tremendous amount of guilt, wouldn't I, you? I would hope so, if he has a conscience. But And the, I guess the only good thing was that they didn't shoot the baby, too. Well, yeah, thank God for that. Now, Bill Payne's sister Tracy believes that Janelle became enraged when Billie Jean was with Bill and when she became pregnant with his child. And that's when she invented Chris and decided to seek revenge. Yeah, she wanted Bill for herself. Seems that way. Not going to share. <laughs> no, I don't think anyone wanted to share anyway. That wasn't an option. So Janelle became obsessed with Billie Jean and her friends. We know that. She wrote spiteful, vicious things about the victims. Billie Jean's friend Lindsay was interviewed, and she confirmed that she and Billie Jean had been harassed over the phone and in person by both Janelle and Barbara. Lindsay said that she was getting calls from the Potter house, but he would get on the phone and tell her to quit calling. <laughs> she would tell him that Janelle was calling her, but Buddy said, no, I don't believe you. You're the one that's calling us. Right, right. He told Lindsay that he would kick her ass. That's crazy. Then Lindsay's boyfriend would often get on the phone and the two men would argue. And Janelle really seemed to get off on the whole thing because she's getting attention. Yeah. So investigators asked Lindsay about Janelle's claims that Lindsay would drive by the Potter house to harass them. Lindsay said she had driven by the house only when she drove to her mother's house because the Potter's house was on the way. She said she never stopped or talked to any of the Potters. She had never actually met Janelle, just spoke to her over the phone or online. Now, when Lindsay was shown threatening Facebook messages that she had supposedly written to Janelle, she denied writing them. She said, well, my grammar's not that bad. <laughs> yeah. Besides, her own name was misspelled. <laughs> You'd think you could spell your own name, right? I would think so. So in the fall of 2013, Barbara, Buddy, and Janelle Potter were scheduled to go on trial for the murders of Billie Jean Hayworth and Bill Payne. Jamie Curd accepted a 25-year plea deal in exchange for his testimony. That's not that great of a plea, though. 25 years is a long time. Well. For someone who wasn't actually the shooter or the mastermind. He was an accessory. I know. But I would think he could get a better deal than that. Well, he took it. Yeah. So after a five-day trial for Buddy and a seven-day trial for Barbara and Janelle, the jury found them guilty on two counts of first-degree murder, and they each received two life sentences. So this is remarkable if you think about it. A mother, a father, and their daughter all getting two life sentences each. Yeah. That's really remarkable. I mean, that just doesn't happen every day. It sure doesn't. No. Now, Billie Jean and Bill, of course, aren't the only victims. They're missed by their friends. Their son, Tyler, will never know his parents. And it's all over this one woman's petty jealousy and selfishness, or two women's, because Barbara's probably almost as responsible as Janelle there. Well, I'm, I'm going to take the viewpoint that Barbara's the main force. Really? Behind this. Okay. Okay. All right. I mean, I know that Janelle has her moments. And, so and don't you think that Janelle fooled Barbara, though? Or do you think Barbara knew and she just enjoyed it? I think that. Yeah, that could because be. Because we hear about how when Janelle was younger, Barbara always stuck up for her. Sure. And would threaten people that she perceived as threatening her daughter. Right. So she'd probably lie for her. Right. 
So, and, and I'm just thinking that Janelle's limited in intelligence. And, and I don't think necessarily that she figured this out by herself. I think her mother uh, suggested things to her. Maybe, because Barbara was disturbed. Christy said Barbara was always kind of like that, too. Yeah. So, I, I mean, that's, I'm not trying to minimize Janelle's involvement in it. No, I know. But to me, the, the most guilty person is Barbara. Okay, even though Buddy's the shooter. Yeah. But they all deserve to be in prison for they, life, really. Well, they do. Yeah. And Buddy's the shooter because basically he was told to do that by his wife. Right. Or Chris or whoever. Right. So 2020 on ABC, they had a special on this case. Do you want to hear what Barbara Potter's reaction was to their coverage? Oh, I'd love to. Okay. So Barbara wrote a letter through her attorney. In addition to my career at Longwood Gardens, I have raised a family that still loves me and that I still love. I was the caregiver for my disabled husband, Marvin, my disabled child, Janelle, and my aging mother, May. It was a very difficult time, but nothing like the challenges that confront me now. Our family has withstood many storms. Somehow we will survive this one. There is a reason my daughter Janelle was awarded disability benefits from the United States Social Security Administration and has been receiving those benefits from a relatively young age. She is and always has been vulnerable. The murders of Billy Clay Payne and Billie Jean Hayworth devastated many lives, our family included. We have persevered through many great challenges in life, and I believe in my heart that justice will someday be done and the truth about this case and about my family will be revealed. Aside from the victim's infant child, the physical evidence in this case, never shown anyone other than Jamie Lynn Curd, was present in the Payne home when Billy Payne and Billie Jean Hayworth were heinously murdered. Jamie Heard knew the house, having lived there with Billy Payne up until Payne met Hayworth, and Jamie Curd moved out. He moved in with his dying mother. Jamie Curd is still the only person connected to this case known to have used methamphetamine. A pipe, card, and methamphetamine residue were recovered from a dresser next to Mrs. Ms. Hayworth's body. That evidence was never tested for the presence of fingerprint or DNA evidence. Kurd had the motive, the opportunity, and the means to commit the crime, and he needed no assistance, certainly not from a man who was on oxygen and multiple medications at the time. Per Kurd's own sworn testimony, there was never any discussion of murder with anyone. Some five hours after the murders were committed, Jamie Kurd was still at the crime scene, watching as medics from two rescue squads arrived at the scene without any police escort. While he watched, Jamie was texting a confidant. That confidant was not a member of my family, exclamation point. Jamie Curd was texting his own niece, a woman who has hardly ever been questioned about this case to this point. Despite the fact that she was monitoring police EMS scanner traffic for Jamie for his first and only time that morning. Why? Because the police don't care to investigate this because it doesn't fit into their theory of this case. The state has botched their investigation of this case from the very first. What started with the Johnson County 911 sending medics into a non-secure crime scene as the shooter watched their response has now led to my incarceration at the Tennessee Prison for Women. Four people are currently serving life sentences over one hideous crime. In the process, many mistakes have been made. It is an undisputed fact that the state of Tennessee never even bothered checking to see if my computer was even operating during the times that so much of the so-called email evidence in this case was created. Jamie Kurtz's polygraph was a central element of 2020 coverage. The police didn't offer me, Marvin, or Janelle the opportunity to take a polygraph. The first time I was asked to take a polygraph was when my lawyer told me the 2020 program had offered to bring in a polygraph expert to give me the test. That was while I was being held at the Mountain City Jail after being convicted. I gladly accepted 2020's offer to take a polygraph. You don't have to take my word for it because that fact was revealed in the program. As it turned out, 2020 had the integrity to actually offer to give me the polygraph. In contrast, the state of Tennessee and Johnson County Sheriff's Department made sure I was transported to the Tennessee Prison for Women before the test could be performed. I guess it wouldn't look good for the state of Tennessee if that polygraph test had cleared me of this crime. 
it is beyond belief that the state of Tennessee fully plans to release Jamie Kurd from the prison following his upcoming parole hearing and may very well be celebrating at his home this Christmas. Undoubtedly, he has a lot of reasons to celebrate, one being that he became eligible for parole on September 2, 2015. That fact alone confirms that absolute failure of justice in Mountain City, Tennessee. So obviously her lawyer helped her because the grammar is much better. That's very grammatically correct. But she's in full denial. She's not taking any responsibility. None whatsoever. Now you could say that's because she's innocent, but I don't think well, so. Well, I guess you could say that, but didn't her husband confess? Yes, but she said he was without oxygen and his medications, so he wasn't thinking clearly. So she says. Right. But there's plenty of times that we've seen him or known of him being without oxygen. Well, like during the murders, he didn't bring and, his oxygen. And functioning quite well. Well, yeah, I think so. so. I so, think so. So I, quite I a story, I think she's, huh? she's still kind of delusional. Yeah. So if you've enjoyed the complexity of this case as much as Dick and I did, we recommend you check out Hunt a Killer. You can find out if you'd be a good detective. Hunt a Killer is the first ever interactive investigation that delivers clues and correspondence from a serial killer to you. Apply for membership at www.huntakiller.com and your first episode ships the same day you join. To help support True Crime Brewery, Hunt a Killer is offering our listeners 10% off when you go to www.huntakiller.com and use our code BREWERY. Enjoy the hunt! So, you know, Dick, sometimes I'll be out walking the dogs or riding my bike, and people come up to me and they ask, what's new with Tie Grabber? So I thought I should say on this episode, what's going on, to let our listeners know. What's new? Then they won't have to pull me over and ask me quite as often. Well, you're a minor celebrity here in our town. Right. So our fourth episode in our series on the O.J. Simpson murders was released last week, and we've gotten some good feedback on that, so thank you, everybody. The murder and the trial is over in this episode, but we thought it was interesting to learn about the aftermath and the disaster that finally put O.J. in prison. It really did seem like he got an extra harsh sentence, though, don't you think? No. You don't? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot that I didn't know, and it was pretty cool. We talked to Adam, who does the tour, and he's got it down pretty well. He's the O.J. expert. That's what we call yeah. him. You know, I, I, I guess if you just look at the terms of the sentence, that was probably harsh. But I'm I'm throwing in the fact that he was getting away with two murders. Well, yeah. And, and that's why he got that length of a sentence. Well, sure. But I don't know if that's a very legal thing to do. No. So I just said, no, I don't think that's too harsh a sentence. Okay. <laughs> so far, the most recommended case for our next Members Only episode is the case of Tina Watson. Now, Tina was on her honeymoon in Australia when she died scuba diving. Her husband was suspected of murdering her. So this is a complex case with lots of room for speculation and debate. So if you'd like to get your vote in on what we're going to have for our next Members Only episode, in our True Crime Brewery Fan Discussions group, I have put in a poll where you can choose which case. And we have some different choices, plus you can add your own case if you want. But like I said, so far, Tina's winning. And we're going to have it out there for at least another week, though, so there's plenty of time to get in there and vote. Get your votes in. Besides, if you like the podcast, you probably want to join the fan discussion page, even if you don't participate. There's some cool stuff to read. Yeah, well, you can be a lurker. Well, sure, because there's all these true crime addicts, and they're always coming up with stuff. Yeah. They amaze it's, me. It's a stimulating place. It sure is. Now, if you haven't joined Tie Grabber, it's easy peasy. Just go to tiegrabber.com forward slash team perks and sign up with PayPal. We also have a brewery shop, so purchase some merch if you like. And there's also an absolutely free way for you to give us support. The next time you shop Amazon, go in through our link on Tie Grabber. Then Amazon will give us a tiny kickback from the purchases you make. And these are things you're going to buy anyway, and we won't know what you bought. So that's a great way to support us. Also, we do have a page on Patreon where I post all of our episodes, including our members-only episodes for patrons. If you listen to us on iTunes, please subscribe to us and leave us a review there because that really helps us find new listeners for the podcast. Also, just to let you know, we do have another podcast by Ty Grabber, and Dick and I are the hosts, and it's called Watching ID. And what Watching ID is, is pretty much what the name says. We watch a TV show on ID, Investigation Discovery, so true crime shows, 
and then we talk about it. We go through the plot, we talk about how it was handled, all that kind of stuff. So it's a fun show. It's not consistent every week, but we do quite a few of them. And we are doing the one this week on the show Grave Mysteries, which we did a couple weeks ago, that show, and we enjoyed it quite a bit. It seems to focus on crimes that involve the internet. So a little bit similar to this episode. So if that's the kind of thing that interests you, check it out. That's Watching ID, and that's also on iTunes and other podcast apps. If you have feedback for us, which we really encourage, you can contact us at True Crime Brewery at tigrabber.com. We're on Twitter at Tigrabber Pods and Instagram, Tigrabber Podcasts. Like I said, we also have the Facebook group of True Crime Brewery fan discussions, and we have a Facebook page. As always, we appreciate all of our listeners. We appreciate feedback. We love the support. Like I always say, if it weren't for our listeners, we'd just be two quirky people in a little room upstairs talking about murder. (laughs) Right? Well, seeing as how you put it that way. So it's important (laughs) that we have listeners. Yes. (laughs) Okay, let's get a little music and some feedback. What do you think? All right. Great feedback this week. We've had some great stuff. Ticket to anywhere, maybe we make a deal. Maybe together we can get somewhere. Any place is better. Starting from zero, got nothing to lose. Maybe we'll make something. Me, myself, I got nothing to prove. You got a fast car. I got a plan to get us out of here Been working at the convenience store Managed to save just a little bit of money Won't have to drive too far Just cross the border and into the city You and I can both get jobs and Finally see what it means to be living Welcome to Feedback Do I get to go first? Absolutely, Dickie. Go for it. Oh, thank you. Sure. So I got a a message on Gmail from Alicia Marley. So I've been going back and listening to all the episodes. Your voices have become a soothing point in my workday. I love your interactions with each other. You take the time to listen to what the other says and are very accepting of each other. But also the questions you ask to really push the different opinions of each other make the case feel more thoroughly covered. Your research behind each case is obviously very thorough, and I've often wondered how you're able to do so much in order to actually publish a new episode weekly. Me too. (laughs) Yeah, sometimes we think the same thing. Because sometimes I'm really busting my ass to get it done. I'm so glad you covered the John Binet case, even though you had doubts. For sure this case had been so widely covered, and especially around this time last year for the 20-year anniversary but I did not know about the fibers on the duct tape from Patsy's outfit. And I did not know that Patsy was still in the same outfit as from the night before. And I also didn't know about the garage. This is new information, and I love it. Alicia goes on. Also, Dick, do you have a thing against Boulevard? I'm from Kansas City, and I got so excited when the most recent case was from Kansas City, hoping to get a Boulevard review. Will you consider it for another KC case? Well, I I would be happy to. I mean, Boulevard is one of those breweries that is top ranked. Oh, is it? But I've never had any Boulevard beers. Oh. So maybe. Well, maybe she should send you some. Maybe, Alicia, we could work a beer trade or something. If you want some main beers, you could send me some Boulevard beers. I'll send you some Allagash beers or something. That's how you get a lot of your beers from across the country, yeah. is doing so, a beer trade. So send us an email and uh, we can negotiate. Because I don't like to ask people just to send beer because the shipping is pricey. Can be. But if someone wants to do a swap, that's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. And, and I've, I mean, when I go through beer reviews and stuff, Boulevard is always one of the higher ranked breweries. So I, I would absolutely love to have some Boulevard beers. Well, maybe we should take a trip there if we can find a crime there. Have a little meetup at the Boulevard sure. Brewery. We'd have to eat barbecue. Well, okay. Barbecued tofu, maybe. 
Right. Also, I recently learned about this case, Amy Lynn Bradley. I can't tell that you've covered it, but it's totally stuck with me, and I'd love to hear it from your perspective. Well, Alicia, Amy Lynn Bradley, I think, is the very first case we ever did. It is, but you know what? I moved it to the members-only feed. Oh. Because originally I was going to take the old episodes and like once a month put one of the old ones in there. Mm -hmm. But I decided not to do that. I thought that was kind of cheesy. Okay. But Amy Lynn is still in there, but I would hesitate to advise her to listen to it, right? Because it's the first one. It's kind of horrible yeah. in my ears. Well, we're always our harshest critics. I know, but it's but... like we had very minimal equipment. Yeah, I was... didn't really know how to edit. Com compared to how we're doing now, and, and we realize we still have a long way to go. Right. But compared to now versus a year and a half ago. It was painful. Holy cow. It's painful. Yeah. But it, it is there. So I it guess is. if you want to look at it. And most people are very forgiving. I really appreciate that. Most people don't criticize, even though there's plenty of room to criticize. <laughs> people forgive our, our faults. Well, I've, I've listened to some just like a year ago, not even Amy Bradley age. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and they're not great. No. Well, So. Well, that's the thing, though. We're always improving, so we, that's well, good. Well, we're trying to always improve. Right. But there's a, there is a, an episode. There is. And, and we had a great time doing that. It was a fascinating case. Well, and the thing with the John Bonet episode, that was just part of our 12 Beers of Christmas series. So that wasn't a thorough episode at all. So I'm really surprised that she learned anything from it. Because I'd actually been considering doing a thorough episode on that where we actually do more research. I mean, for the 12 beers of Christmas, we did an episode every day for two weeks, right. pretty much. And John Binet was the longest one we did, but it still wasn't that long. No. Half hour, maybe? No, because we just pretty much had to do an online search and use a lot of Wikipedia just to yeah. pump them out. So some of those I thought about revisiting. That'd be good. In a more thorough way. Okay. Okay. So I have an email from Barb, and Barb says, Hello, I have recently discovered podcasts, and I really enjoy Jill and Dick's discussions about the various crimes and or disappearances, and their ability to voice their different points of view without being offensive or officious with each other. I listened to Sins of the Father the other day and was intrigued with the mention of prosperity religion and the posit that Christopher felt entitled. Now we remember this episode, right? Joyce Meyer's Chris Coleman. bodyguard. Yeah. Bodyguard, security chief. Security, no, yeah. chief of security, yeah. So I immediately thought of the case of Reverend Thomas Bird and Lorna Anderson in Emporia, Kansas. Would that be close enough to do the Boulevard beer? It would be. All right. The two conspired to have each other's spouses killed so that they could be together because Thomas Bird felt that he was in some way meant for a greater mission. There was a movie made called Murder Ordained that aired before the trial, and some say it contributed to the convictions. Both people are now out of prison, and I believe that the reporter that covered the trial is alive and well. That might be someone we could contact. Yeah. So to this day, Thomas Bird denies his role in the death of his wife and Lorna's husband. I thought this would be a great fit for Jill and Dick because there remain so many questions, particularly about the death of Sandy Bird. So this really intrigued me, Dick. This is going in our to-do pile. We've heard of this before. We have, and I think it's been recommended before. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it has. Whoever recommended it before, Barb, I apologize. I didn't give you credit, mm -hmm. but, but it, it's a great suggestion. Yeah. Let's, let's murder our spouses so we can be together. For God. So for that's God. another layer. Oh, that's a big layer. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm destined for great things. Well, and that's what we thought with Chris Coleman. He thought he was too good for his family, pretty much. Yeah. Gross. Gross. That is one of the grossest crimes. He killed his own little boys and his wife. And he strangled them, didn't he? Yeah. I mean, very, that's... very brutal. Ugh. Hands on for another woman. Right. Real sicko. Yeah, that's that one haunts me. Okay, I got another one. Okay. Who's Hi. that from? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> Let me see. It looks anonymous. Yeah, it's anonymous. Okay. See? So anonymous says, and please, anonymous, once you hear me discuss this, Tell us who you are. <laughs> You're my favorites. Please never change. I'm writing to recommend that you cover the murder of Dylan Redwine. Dylan was 13 years old when he disappeared in November 2012 while staying at his father Mark Redwine's house in Vallecito on a court-ordered visitation for the Thanksgiving holiday. Dylan, who was living in Colorado Springs with his mother, Elaine Hall, flew to Durango La Plata County Airport on Sunday, November 18, 2012, where Mark Redwine met him. 
He was arrested in connection with the murder in the, on November 2012 of Dillon. A grand jury issued an indictment for Redwine's arrest on July 22nd of this year after reviewing evidence presented by 6th Judicial District Attorney Christian Champagne. The jury determined that there was probable cause to charge Redwine in connection with his son's death. The Bellingham Police Department apprehended Redwine in Bellingham, Washington, on a warrant issued by the 6th Judicial District Court in Durango. He's being held on a $1 million cash-only bond. Following extradition proceedings in Washington, Redwine will be advised of the charges sought against him at a hearing at the La Plata County Courthouse. District Judge Jeffrey Wilson will preside. This is a heartbreaking complex case. Dylan did not want to see his dad and planned to confront him during his visit about some deviant pictures of his father that he'd found on his computer. Both Dylan's mom and his half-brother believe that Mark is responsible for Dylan's murder. Sounds interesting. I have interesting. heard of that case. It's interesting. It's sad. Maybe we'll cover it. I can put it in the maybe pile. Let's wait and see what happens with the case, with the uh, court case. Yeah, let's let's get the trial. But it's sad. I mean, it's kind of like this Chris Coleman. How can a man kill his own child like that? I mean, I know it happens, but I don't get it. Yeah, I know. It, it's just... That goes beyond to, the to pale. most of us, it's just so far in a concept. Yeah, because most of us, our children come first before ourselves. Right. So that's really awful. Okay, so I have a letter from Gina from YouTube. She's one of our YouTube listeners. Thank you for covering this story. I remember following it faithfully on Nancy Grace, and I often wondered if it had been solved. So this was about, this is the case of Haley, Haley Cummings. She's talking about drugging a child. That right. was in response to our most recent episode, yeah, The Lost Girl. One of our hypotheses. Right. So, my nephew was murdered when he was eight years old in 2006 by his adopted mother. She overdosed him on her morphine pills. She gave multiple people different stories about how he accidentally got into her pills. She gave him something to help him sleep. She doesn't know what happened. Things like that. He was cremated quickly after taking off life support, and she was never held accountable for his death. And she cut my family off after the funeral. It had been an open adoption. So your theory that Misty may have drugged Haley to put her to sleep, or she may have accidentally gotten into the meds and died, really resonated with me. I don't think it happened at a party, because if there were many people there, I think somebody would have spilled the beans. Maybe even anonymously tipped off the police. On a side note, I was listening to Leonard Cohen, Healing of the Spirit, song earlier, and my nine-year-old daughter asked me, is that Dick singing? I say, no, honey, but who's Dick? And she says, you know, Dick and Jill, the people you always listen to on YouTube. I had to smile at her. This girl pays more attention to me than I realize. Well, I would just have to say I'm very happy to be compared with Leonard Cohen. Yeah, but she hasn't heard you sing. I, I have. If, it's not good. <laughs> if anybody heard me sing, there's no way on earth you'd compare me with Leonard Cohen. No. Well, you do have a nice husky talking voice, but, though. But uh, that's a compliment. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's cute. And, and I think that uh, probably our, our primary thought was that little Haley had either been accidentally or purposely given drugs. Yeah. Yeah, because Misty was angry and didn't want a babysitter. Right. And I can't see her really losing her temper and physically killing her. She didn't seem like that physical no, to me. she'd stick pills into it. But there's a lot of drugs around, so I think that's a pretty good theory. Yes. Yeah. You want what me to go? Got? Yep. I've got a couple more, but I'll do one now, and then you can do one. So this is from Stephanie. Great as always, I love how in-depth you get. I would be thrilled if you would consider covering the cases of the kidnapping of Stephen Gregory Stainer, and the case of Franklin Delano Floyd, which is by far one of the most complicated cases I've ever heard. So Franklin Delano Floyd, this sounds really interesting. Does it? Yeah. All right, tell us. So he's an American death row inmate. He's on death row, but not not killed. He was convicted. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it was just funny the way you put that. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's put it another he's way. He's not killed. He's, he's an American death row inmate. He's convicted of the 1989 murder of Cheryl Ann Comesso, an exotic dancer from Florida, as well as the kidnapping of his six-year-old stepson from his elementary school in Choctaw, Oklahoma. He's also considered a person of interest in the hit-and-run death of his wife, Sharon Marshall, 
here comes the kind of twisted stuff. <laughs> okay. It was later discovered that prior to becoming his wife, Sharon was raised by Floyd from an early age as his daughter Ew. and was herself kidnapped by Floyd as a child. Sharon's true identity remained a mystery until 2014 when she was positively identified as Susan Marie Savakis, the daughter of a woman to whom Floyd was briefly married. Wow. He disappeared with Suzanne, her two sisters, and infant brother, while her mother was serving a 30-day jail sentence in 1975. And Suzanne's brother has never been located. Oh. So lots of stuff going on. Yeah. So wow. He marries someone that he's raised as his daughter. Ick. Yeah. I like that. You like it as a case. As a case. We know yeah. what you mean. Okay. You don't like thanks it in general. For, thanks for rescuing me. Yes. But I, I right. definitely think pile. we could do that one. Yep. Definitely. Okay. You can, you do one and then I'll talk about Stephen Stainer. Okay. So this is from Cindy. Jill and Dick, I'm writing in response to your episode, The Baby Thief. At first, I wasn't sure I wanted to listen because it happened such a long time ago, but I'm so glad I tried it. It was an amazing story. I loved the historical aspect of child care, parental rights, and closed adoption laws. It was difficult to believe that these things really happened. How sad for all those families and those poor babies and children who were at the mercy of Georgia Tan and her miscreants. I really appreciate how True Crime Brewery gets into the backgrounds of people and teaches me things. Who knew that learning could be fun? Well, that's a nice letter. Well, learning's supposed to be fun. Yes, it is, but it isn't always. No, it isn't. No. So thanks, Cindy. So this is uh, uh, the other case from Stephanie about Stephen Stainer. Just briefly, mm -hmm. he was an American kidnap victim. He was abducted from the central California city of Merced by child molester Kenneth Parnell. And he lived with his abductor 200 miles away from his family in Mendocino County until he was age 14. And at that time, he was returned to his family when he was discovered while they were returning another one of Parnell's victims, Timothy White, to his own family. Oh, so they found he was there and they suspected? Yeah, so they, they found him. Wow. And he got returned. And he was with his biologic family until 1989 when he was killed in a motorcycle accident. Oh, geez, that's sad. Yeah, so that sounds like an interesting case, too. Yeah, sad, though. Let's put it in the possible file. Okay, so I have one more, and then we'll be done with feedback. So this is kind of directed at you, but I'll read it. It is from Michelle, and it's the subject is Turner Syndrome. Thank you, Jill and Dick, for your thorough and accurate description of Turner Syndrome. When I was listening to True Crime Brewery this week, my heart dropped when I heard this case was about a five-year-old girl with Turner Syndrome, because I'm the mom of a beautiful, almost five-year-old with TS. It's such an uncommon condition, and I was incredibly pleased with Dick's medical explanation. I wish our pediatrician was so informed when we got the diagnosis. Almost nobody had heard of it, unless they are a specialist. Anyway, I just felt compelled to write you this quick note. It's always reassuring to hear accurate information being presented about this rare disorder. Thank you, and keep up the fantastic work, Michelle. Well, I thought that was nice, Dick, for you to hear. I always like to be praised. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I would, I would tell this mom, in, in all modesty, the reason I know maybe a little bit more than the typical pediatrician about Turner syndrome is because I had extra training in genetic disorders. So I, I wish I could say, oh, shucks, all us pediatricians know about Turner syndrome. But I think I'm a little bit of a leg up on most general pediatricians just because I had more training in that area. Yeah, and I think you have an interest in it. Well, yeah. Whenever I see a child that has some kind of characteristic, Dick can usually tell me, oh, they probably have this or that syndrome. I think you're giving me more credit than I actually deserve on that. But who am I to turn down credit? Well, take the credit where you can get it. And speaking of credit... I'd like to give our listeners credit for such great feedback, really some insightful stuff. Like I said, it's the feedback's been really good. People put time into it. Plus, we're getting almost all of our cases now from recommendations. Yeah, we're never going to have to try to figure out cases on our own again. No. So if you have a case you'd like to hear, and like we said last week, if you'd like to throw in a beer from the region that you'd like us to do at the same time, yeah, just write to us at truecrimebrewery at tigrabber.com. So just give us the case that you want to hear and the beer that you want to drink. Sure. Okay. Well, until next week at the quiet end, everybody take care. Yeah, let's get that beer pong going again. Yes, they're waiting. All, All right. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye.